what part of the story becomes this competition between the R100 uh, and, and, and the R101? And it is interesting. They, Thompson should never have done that. He, he split. I mean, there were the, the, the surviving, uh, there was a terrible British air crash in 1921 where basically most of the airship establishment had gone down with it. So there were very few people. Which should, with, have, been, with, should have been a clue, really, shouldn't it? Should have been a clue, yeah. It was <laughs> Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bell. The R101 is one of those, I'm going to say it, great imperial follies. Don't at me for that one. There's been enough about it already. I'm not a fan of the R101 tale. But that's going to make up our entire episode this week, as we're joined by the fabulous S.C. Gwynn, whose new book, His Majesty's Airship, is all about the men behind the creation of one of the largest air vessels ever completed, built, the whole shebang, here in the UK, just outside Bedford at Cardington. Now, Sam is an author who I've been really looking forward to talking to, because this other book of his, which is called Empire of the Summer Moon, all about Quanah Parker, is one that I've lent to people before I've had a chance to read and never gotten back. So the one I'm waving around, if you're watching this on YouTube, is the third time I've bought it. So I'm going to get stuck into that as well. And that's where we have to start, because before we get into His Majesty's Airship, I have to ask him what led him to make the leap from his usual haunts of the United States in the 19th century to come over here to Britain and a massive bag filled with hydrogen. Like I said, Empire of the Summer Moon has been on my reading list for ages. And I guess a lot that sort of framed a lot of your work being 19th century Americana, I suppose. How does someone who spent a lot of their career with quite well reputes with your work as well how do you come to write about <laughs> an airship in mid-century britain because that seems a bit of a leap or was it intentional <laughs> to do something that different after a few books in no in it's uh you know it's uh i was i think um based on my my uh book about the comanches and then a, a biography of stonewall jackson and another book about the civil war i mean i think people think of me as being planted firmly in the 19th century somewhere um I I never really saw myself that way. I mean, I'm I I in most of my career I've been a journalist, and and journalists have short attention spans, generally speaking. And uh, you know, you do your story, and it's on the bottom of someone's birdcage by Monday night or whenever, and then you move on to the next story, and uh, and what kind of makes you happy are good stories, and you're looking for good stories, and you're never on one very long. But anyway, so journalists, yes, have a, the attention span of a gnat. So for me, I have been trying to really just find the, the very best stories that I that I can find. And uh, typically, I want them to be, uh, you know, uh, cer certainly set in history and, and almost always beyond human memory, uh, but also to be about some sort of a, a great tale, but also set in some larger kind of uh, scene, something with, with larger meaning. And so I'm, I was reading, okay, this is a long winded way of answering your question, but uh, Go for it. so I was reading, I was reading a, a, a three volume history of the British empire, a magnificent history by a writer named James Morris, who became later Jan Morris, mm -hmm. a British historian, just magnificent, just, it knocks me down. It's so good. It's called uh, the Pax Britannica is, is the trilogy. And the third volume is, is Farewell to Trumpets. And it's about how kind of the British Empire is starting to get a little creaky and, you know, the, the, and eventually declines. And so the book is about traces the empire from its apogee in Victorian times to what happened in the, in the 20th century. And inside of this book, there was a little two page section on this airship that was somehow all wound up in all these imperial ambitions and all this kind of sense of Britain coming out of World War I as the largest empire in the history of the world and what was it going to do with the empire and this crash that was more, much more interesting than the Hindenburg. And I thought, this is a great story. And, and so it's, it's a great tale. The Hindenburg really isn't that great a tale. It's, it's just like what made the thing go boom. R101, as you have seen, is, is a fascinating tale that spans years and all sorts of great characters and um, and so I was just able to, I just thought that this is, this is great. It's a book about 
Empire. It's a book about. It's a great book about a crash that was, you know, more lethal again than the Hindenburg. But, but, and and the third thing I guess that it had, uh, from my point of view, was that nobody knew about it. Somehow history had overwritten R101 for whatever reason. It's a, there's no reason it should have. It, it, it overwrote Herbert Scott, the guy, the the, the great airship pilot who did the first east-west crossing of the Atlantic. Anyway, I'm going on and on and on, but that's that's a really long-winded answer to your question. Oh, fabulous long-winded answer. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you may but have it, some more on the way. As a Canadian who's lived here for more than he's ever lived in Canada, I've learned that the British are very good at moving on from disasters, or they make a great thing about it. Yeah. Yeah, they give somebody a whole bunch of VCs and they forget about the thing that happened a little bit earlier. <laughs> and dear listener, if you have not read any of Jan Morris's work, do check it out because Jan was brilliant. Jan was, brilliant. Uh, what, was wasn't wasn't she the um, the only reporter that was with the Hillary Norden expedition to Everest as well? It, fantastic. Life. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and a, a a lot of books and a a lot of mm. uh, a, a wide wide scope of endeavor and types of histories and everything. But this, I say, Pax Britannica. If you want to read a, like a one volume history, of, well, three, in this case, three volume history <laughs> of the uh, the British Empire, uh, I, this is as good as I can imagine. Right. Let's get on. Before we get on track, I'm just going to say, if anyone has my copy of Empire of the Summerland, give it back because <laughs> I still need to read it, um, which is Sam's book about Quanta Parker. Do it. Um, right. So let's let's start simple here. We've, we've, we've done the what brought you into it, but we have to be clear about this. What is an airship? Because we're going to be talking about a couple of them in the course yes. of our chat. How, it's it's not a blimp, is it? It's it's as we would recognize flying over sporting events and things like that. An airship is a specific type of craft, isn't it? Yes, and it really is. I'm glad you asked that question first because we have to define terms here. And and uh, in fact, what we're talking about here is a rigid airship. Mm -hmm. R rigid is the key. Actually, an airship can almost define anything that can go up and has a rudder and a propeller and, and is lighter than air and can fly around. But a, a rigid airship, but we'll get to it in a second. Okay, so the 18th century, they invented balloons. And balloons were these remarkable things. I mean, they were lighter than air and, and they went up in a world where, as you and I know, everything else goes down. These things went up. Kind of amazing. Wow, it goes up. And uh, the problem with if you put hydrogen or hot air in a balloon it would kind of go wherever the wind or God wanted it to go. And uh, they were great as military observation, you know, vehicles, but they weren't very good uh, for much else because they would just go where they want. Anyway, in the, in the uh, 19th century, the, the French improved this by, uh, by, invent, by basically putting right a, a propeller and an engine and a, and a, and a rudder onto a balloon. And this became kind of the first airship because it was steerable. And the word in French for to be able to, to steer or direct is diriger. And something that you could direct became a dirigeable, you know, dirigible. And, uh, but the, the problem with balloons, which were just really – it's just an envelope that you filled up you know, like a balloon with gas of some kind and it went up, was that they tended to collapse on themselves and they really didn't um, – uh, you know, they, they couldn't lift much was the problem. I mean, it's something that collapsed on itself easy once you got to a certain size. And I mean, you know, like 120 feet or 150 feet, that was about it. So you could only lift as much as, as the you know gas that you could put in the balloon. And so in 1900, this, uh, this brilliant uh, German entrepreneur uh, named Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin with a magnificent walrus mustache, invented the rigid airship. And what the rigid airship was, it had a skeleton. It had a steel skeleton. And inside the skeleton were hydrogen-filled gas bags. And because these things, because von Zeppelin's first ship, I think, was 430 feet long, these enormous things, you could put so many hydrogen gas bags in it, you could lift a lot. And this was the absolutely groundbreaking, you know, uh, piece of technology in the, in the Zeppelin. So starting in in 1900, you have the advent of the rigid airship. They were all big. They got eventually to more than 800 feet long, um, the German airships of the 30s, like the Hindenburg. And it just, and, you know, again, they, because of that, they could, they could lift a lot of whatever it was you wanted to lift, you know, people, cargo, or uh, in the case of uh, the Germans, bombs. I think that answers your question. Anyway, but that, oh, and I should say that if we, if we look at 
the blimps that fly like the Fuji blimp or the Goodyear blimp or whatever the blimps that may be, um, those are really, they're, they're, they're not rigid. They don't have a steel structure. They may have a keel that's rigid, but they're really just, it's a balloon, an envelope filled up with, in this case, helium uh, that allows them to, to be lighter than air and, and float. But they're not, one of the things, if you look at one of the blimps that flies over Wembley or flies over whatever they're flying over in America football games, baseball games and so forth, they're, they're not that big. That's because they're constrained by the fact that they don't have the rigid skeleton. So when you think of, uh, when people think of the, you know, the most famous airship, the, the one everybody knows about, Hindenburg, uh, it, that is a giant, that, that is exactly what a, a rigid airship is. It's a, it's a giant steel structure filled with hydrogen. And they enter the public consciousness because they're just the most amazing things because they're the almost the main character in H.G. Wells' War in the Air as, as well, aren't they? They're the, they're the thing that terrorizes... It's um, a terror weapon. Brit yeah. And then, remarkably, as Wells tended to get things right, that's exactly what happened in the First World War. These things started trend trundling over. And they they capture imagination in a way that probably outsizes their actual usefulness, doesn't it? That is a really good observation because the question just persists with airships is why they were kind of a bad idea and why did they persist so long? But there was something about them, you know, that they were, they were these large things. And as you said, so when, when von Zeppelin invented them, he didn't intend for them to be a, a passenger airships or cargo airships. I mean, he had one and only one use for them and that was uh, as weapons. And uh, that was all he wanted to do. And he was very much in step with the, the times in, in Germany as we approached World War I. Uh, in fact, there was a, I quote in my book, a song that German school children were singing in 1913, I think. And it was fly, Zeppelin fly, you know, fly to England, England shall be destroyed by fire. You know, cute little German kids. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> point being that there was a martial, a martial sentiment in Germany at that time, and 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 uh, and so Zeppelins, and people forget about this. People think of you know London being bombed by the Luftwaffe in the World War II and everything. But the first long-range bombers, the first weapons of mass terror, were Zeppelins unleashed by Germany against seven European cities, uh, mostly against uh, England. Um, and in and they these were just they were entirely designed to be weapons. They were weapons. They didn't work very well as weapons, but. Uh, that really changed the world. And it introduced it in, in a lot of ways, or actually outright, it induced, uh, introduced humankind to the notion that it could be annihilated from above by something other than a thunderbolt. You know, first time that had ever happened. And as you said, just the size of them, when some 680-foot German Zeppelin came droning over London at 2 a.m., I mean, this was, you know, this was just absolutely nothing that anybody had even imagined before. Big, noisy, and slow. Yes. That, that's always my takeaway from those stories. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And 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 as as we as yeah, everybody knows about airships. They're they're designed to be these weapons of war, but they're filled with massive amounts of highly explosive gas. Yeah, so you, you here's what you have to add to your, your configuration. Big, noisy, and slow, and which is great if you're a British fighter plane. <laughs> oh, but we add the fourth thing, which is oh yes, and they're filled with hydrogen. <laughs> it's like, like let's let's play video games. One incendiary bullet from a a, a British fighter in nineteen sixteen seventeen. I mean, we just imagine the Hindenburg. That's what it does. Hmm. Quite satisfying if you're the fighter pilot. Yeah, and oh, that that that's that's another podcast. Yeah, the the, <laughs> the strange VCs that are awarded for shooting down zeppelins. It's uh, yes. They're fantastic. Anyways, let's let's start getting into our, our sort of characters here because they they leave this, like we say, oversized memory, isn't it? Because there's an expectation of these things being these incredible marvels of German engineering. But what you do in the book so well is talk about how rushed they the Zeppelins actually are. That they they get progressively less engineered as they go along, don't they? But the British have this idea of as as we all do. A German engineered marvel, and they exit the war thinking that this is the way forward, isn't it? 
It is, in spite of the fact that so many of the German Zeppelins went down. I mean, they went down through from you know, fighter incendiary bullets from fighter planes. They crashed in their, they burned in their sheds. They crashed into the channel. They were blown to God knows where. I mean, they were, they were very difficult to navigate. They were easy to shoot down, and they were lousy as weapons. But still, in World War One, Britain saw them. Britain saw them as technology that they couldn't get, and they tried very, very hard to get it. They tried to emulate the Germans, but the Germans had a, a, a good lead, I mean, a really good lead on them. And so when the British built an airship, what they do is they, they go find a downed Zeppelin, and they they kind of they, they'd crawl all over it with the engineers, and they would sort of figure out, do the best they could to figure out how it worked. And then they would engineer it up, And but by the time they put that airship into the air, they were several years behind the Germans. And the Germans, if that airship could fly at 10,000 feet, two years later, by the time the British had it, the Germans could fly at 20,000 feet or had bigger engines and more lift. And so Britain spent spent all of World War I trying to catch up and never got an operational, they were good, they intended to use them mostly as scouts, but they never really got an operational uh, airship, rigid airship. Coming out of the war, of course, uh, Germany, which was the by far the, the leader, I mean, there was even close, was forbidden now from building any of these things, certainly not for weapons, but they were had difficulty building any of them because of the Versailles Treaty. And so you had this moment where the, the Brits say, OK, here we go. You know, we've got this clear field to play on. We're going to we're going to start. We're going to put British technology. We're going to improve and perfect these German Zeppelins. Um, and this is what happened in the 1920s. And the, the hero of my, well, the hero airship of my book, R101, is the, the sort of final product of the British attempt to do the Germans one better, um, to kind of perfect this idea that, that was flawed. The problem was that it, it, there were flaws that no matter how much technology the, Brit, the British put into it, uh, it, 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 it didn't solve the underlying flaw, flaws, I should say. Which were not now. Hydrogen was just one of them. There were many, many flaws. Hydrogen was just one of them. Note to listeners: we're we're big fans of hydrogen on the show, but for different uses than for airships. Different uses. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm reading about hydrogen these days. It may be the it may save the planet. It may save everything. But but in this particular application, in, yeah, for- uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let Let's get on to Christopher Thomas because he is a remarkably British character. It's the only way I can come yes. to describe him, isn't he? He's quintessential product of empire. Of empire. Yeah. Why did he have this belief in what, what we'll go on to talk about is the Imperial Airship Scheme? What, why yeah. was he so driven? Because it seems in researching around him outside your book, he's in, in inseparable from this idea of the airship as crowning glory of empire. He is. He's he's the here's central character in the book. He's the hero of the book. He is a, a product of five generations of of military, uh, mostly generals, but very influential people in the in the Raj. Uh, you know, he he all of his family on both sides enormously influential. Were uh, were, were grew up in India. I mean, going back to the the uh, going back to the 18th century. And so he grows up there. He eventually moves to England. He he then uh, he then participates in in many many military campaigns, you know, which include the Boer War and include Palestine. I mean, he was with Kitchener. I mean, he was he fought in all of these theaters of empire. Uh, and so we have this guy who, uh, even though very quite interestingly, he he's a socialist. He 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 joined the first Labour government, uh, Ramsay MacDonald's government, but he was still very very much. A, a man of empire, and which is appropriate because uh, he was the man who, who had the vision that drove e- essentially R101 into the ground eventually. But the, the original vision was to populate the, the skies of the world, which was largely a British world, with British airships using British technology a kind of a restoration in some ways to, you know, when you think of the British empire in the 19th century, you think of the, the pounding piston, you know, the grease piston and just the tech 
technological ability. They could build guns and they could build machines and locomotives and boats. I mean, better than anybody else. And the empire power resisted, I mean, rested on this. And, uh, and to some extent, the vision that Thompson, Christopher Birdwood Thompson had was to, uh, in a sense, restore uh, the kind of British technological supremacy in the air, in this case, through airships. So it was a grand vision, as you say, where we can get to the imperial airship scheme whenever you like. Because his, his life is just, you know, the, how you described as well. And, and he's he's got the sort of, there's a love interest in the in the tale as well, who probably deserves her own biography as well. Who Who is she? Yeah, so... Uh, so Thompson, uh, Thompson's a military lifer, basically. Um, uh, sort of into his middle forties. Uh, he served in all these theater. He, he, he did, he was a brigadier. He had done pretty well for himself. He, he really performed well at Versailles and made a name for himself. And, uh, but he had met when he was stationed in Bucharest in Romania in World War One. Uh, he was the military attache there. And there was that he met this, a sort of fairy tale princess uh, named Marta Babesco. She really was a fairy tale princess. I mean, she was, you know, she was immensely wealthy. Uh, she was married to a prince. Uh, she had two, not one, but two palaces. Uh, in addition to that, uh, she was the toast of literary Paris. In let's say 1908, 1909, she was the toast of literary Paris. And, and uh, I mean that just as it sounds. She had written a couple of books um, that were bestsellers, that were reviewed, that were widely admired. I mean, Marcel Proust wrote her poems. Andre Gide was a friend. I mean, this was this was the gang that she was rolling with. So we have this fairy tale princess who's immensely immensely wealthy and has palaces in Bucharest and Ro- sorry in Romania, and is the toast of literary Paris. And Thompson, who has you know, he's a very cultivated guy. He speaks five languages, and he's he's um. He's not just a soldier of empire. He's much more sort of, he's not sort of just some, you know, soldier guy. He, he is uh, unusual in, in the in the variety of his interests. So he falls in love with him to some extent for the rest of his life, or the rest of his life becomes the tale of how he's trying to impress Martha. And of course, as a military lifer, when he, the years after he meets her, she's having affairs with, you know, the editor of the largest French daily and the, this the most eligible bachelor in France and the king of you know, Germany and, uh, you know, and princes, this is who she's interested in. And so the book becomes, so as, as Thompson's ambition sort of vaults forward, it's Martha is very much wrapped up in this right, right to the end. It's, it's kind of a great love story behind the, the tale of doomed ambition. I called him Thomas. I don't know why I called him Thomas. Thompson. Thompson. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, close enough. Yeah, near, 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 near Lord, Lord, Lord Thompson of Cardington. This is really interesting. So you can, you can, you know, you get to be a lord, right? If you're Kitchener, you can choose to be Kitchener of Khartoum. Yeah, all right. right? That's oh, yeah. pretty good. Yeah, it's you can it's, do it's, that. Half, well, it's half the fun of getting the gig. Yeah. Yeah, right. So, so, so Lord Christopher Birdwood, so Christopher Birdwood Thompson is made a lord by Ramsay MacDonald. And I think it was in order that he be able to be in the House of Lords. I guess that's the rule. But anyway, he uh, he chose that this gritty, well, so we have Bedford, right, about an hour mm-hmm. north of London. And then this kind of gritty industrial suburb just south of Bedford, you know, called Cardington, which is where, which is the center of the British airship universe. And he chose to be lord of a gritty little industrial suburb of Bedford. Kind of interesting. Let's get on to the Imperial Airship <laughs> Scheme, because that's why he chooses Cardington, because Cardington yeah. Sheds, which is still there, there's, there. They're, they're making an airship in there at the moment. Yeah, it's... it's That was where that was where Warner Brothers owns them, and mm. and Batman was filmed there. Yeah, and... Oh, Bond, I was in one of the walking around, and some of the set stuff is still stacked there. Anyway, uh, yeah, they, it gets a little did. surreal. It's, oh, it's fab. Um, <laughs> Again, different podcast. Um, yes, yes. <laughs> so that man connection. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. yes, that, that's oh, we could digress beautifully there. <laughs> um, the imperial airship scheme is is the thing that Thompson nails his his colors to, and his his whole political career is 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 around this. What was it? Because this is when we. When we think of you know aircraft being produced today, yes, we think of subsidies and 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 the like, but 
in this case, this was an entire government, which, let's be fair, was broke, throwing whatever treasure they had behind this scheme of building not one, but two of the most supposedly advanced airships the world had ever seen. Yes, in a way that would that was in their attention to change the world. So to understand the imperial airship scheme, you have to understand what the world looks like to Great Britain as we come out of World War One. As I said, it's very interesting because the even though Great Britain had was had had taken a major hit to its power, to, you know, it, it, when coming out of the war, its naval power supremacy was not unquestioned anymore. It was governed by a formula that said how many you know ships you can build and and there were cracks in the empire you know there were you saw you could just see them adding up the boer war and then there was the irish rebellion and then the rebellion in iraq and and of course what was happening in india india was seething with with discontent but coming out of world war one still uh britain had the largest empire in the history of the world they had taken a lot of the properties of the old Ottoman Empire, some from Germany. They had, you know, the, the famous British color, you know, the British maps with the red color. I mean, you could see it connecting up all around the world. A quarter of the world's population was was within one way or the other between commonwealths and dominions and colonies and everything else, the British Empire. And so this was the reality. And, and so Men of empire who still believed in empire began to dream of some sort of new way to think about their empire. And what what ended up happening was a uh, what 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 started. I think the first reference to an imperial airship scheme was 1922. But by 1924, when Christopher Birdwood Thompson becomes the Secretary of State for Air, which is over all military and civil aviation. Uh, by this point, you know, it's uh, it, it has evolved. And here's here's the idea. Here's what the Imperial Airship Scheme was. It was an attempt to link the far flung, increasingly far flung pieces of the British Empire. And so we to, together through this medium of the air. At that point in history, it was not settled yet whether airplanes or airships were going to be the long range route. Airplanes have long range means of travel. You know, airplanes had real trouble on long trips. I mean, a trip to India was 12 bone rattling days and 26 stops. I mean, it, through the heats of Iraq. And I mean, it was not a lot of fun. So pe- people thought, you know, Lindbergh notwithstanding, you know, that the 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 airships uh, could possibly be the long range travel. Anyway, the, this, this idea, the imperial scheme was to populate the world with British airships that were going to fly from, you know, Sydney to London and South Africa to London and Egypt to, you know, from London to New York or Toronto and back. There was going to be this just connecting up the pieces of the British Empire. And why was this significant? Well, the most, the largest significance I think could be understand by anybody, understood by anybody, which is that, so at this point, it took, for let's say for the, the premier of Australia, of British Dominion, to get to from Sydney to London, uh, a month. That was a month. Airship could do it in eleven days. Uh, from London to Karachi, almost twelve days. Airship could do it in four days. I mean, you're talking two and a half days across the Atlantic. It's not because airships were so fast. It was because they didn't need to land. So they fly at sixty or seventy miles an hour, twenty-four hours. And so, if you're going from London to Karachi. You stopped once in Ismailia, Egypt, and one refueling, and you could make it, and you could make it very, very quickly. And this completely changed in the minds of the people who invented the airship scheme. Lord Thompson, chief among them, this changed the whole world, right? Space and time, the whole everything gets redefined. If you're, and the, and the empire becomes much, much closer together. You know, eleven days versus a month to Australia, for example. And so. Uh, this was the idea, but but beyond that, though, it was so you, you're going to have these airships flying back and forth, you know, pa- passing each other on the routes of empire. But more or as important as that, though, the technology that was going to dominate this new version of long range travel was going to be British. And that is what R101, the hero airship of my story was R101 was and its sister ship R100 
were Christopher Birdwood Thompson's uh, attempt to use this new, to improve the old German technology with the British technology and demonstrate that you could fly these things back and forth safely from places like India, you know, which was still, you know, within the British Empire and ruled by the British and had 300 and you know, 20 million people in it. Uh, this was going to change the world. They thought they were going to change the world. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are with the Pima Air and Space Museum's Learjet Model 23. Model 23 was Learjet's first small business jet. This one was owned by the Timken family of uh, Ohio, the Timken ball bearings. They were a company that made well-known ball bearings for all different types of machinery. Louise Timken was the matriarch of the family and she was the first woman to get a jet pilot's license here in the United States for the Learjet. Um, she had gotten a license for a smaller, uh, like four seat jet beforehand. Um, the zebra skin inside on the seats was from a zebra that she shot in safari back in the day. Um, they uh, flew this aircraft uh, for many years before, uh, or after they had moved out and retired out here to Arizona, they uh, finally at one point stopped flying the airplane and they donated it here to the Pima Air and Space Museum. Also on display in our Women in Flight exhibit is a red visor and red shoes that she always wore when she was flying this airplane. Um, over the years, Louise Simpkin, you know, has gotten many awards for just, you know, being who she was, you know, in Ohio and here in Arizona. To learn more about what is on display and what events are coming up at the Pima Air and Space Museum in Tucson, Arizona, please do check out their website at www.pimaair.org. And now, back to the show. It, it's it's this weird time, that sort of middle, middle 20s when this is all coming up, because you've got these two technologies that are slightly diverging. And on one hand, you've got still airplanes, which are essentially papery things tied up with string. Um, and you've got these big, massive, potentially luxurious things. And like you said, it's quite a bone rattling trip. So that's why they plumb for airships as opposed to what we would then see explode it 10 years later with commercial air travel in, in, a, in a small phone. But the government decides to go two ways, don't they? And this is where I think it's interesting because you know Thompson's politics is is very much of the of the left, isn't it? So they want an airship of of government and of the people, and yep. one of commerce, and that's the sort of difference between um, one hundred and one hundred one, isn't it? It's 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 a weird political schism almost to to get these things going, which is how Vickers enters the the story as well. Right. And when you think of uh, the, the typical way that uh, aircraft or airships w would have been done, they were, you know, largely companies like Vickers built them, you know, sort of under contract one way or the other. That's how these things got built. And that's how wars got won. But so enter the Britain's first labor government in 1924, Ramsey MacDonald, um, his his great secretary of state for air, Christopher Birdwood Thompson. What they're going to do, they decide, they're going to, you know, for the first time, the British government's going to build, well, R101, it's going to be, they're going to build two ships, actually, but the first one and the main one, and the one that's going to get all the technology and all the money, and that's, that has what I don't know what you call it, uh, I guess cost plus is what I would call it, it's, it's, what, it's whatever you need, whatever you need was R101, and they indeed loaded this thing with all sorts of technology they took diesels up into the air for the first time and material science and pumping science and all sorts of things. So R101 was going to be the, the socialist airship run by the government, um, which would turn out to be a very good example of why governments have trouble building things. But uh, the other airship was the more traditional, you know, the way you would normally, they gave Vickers a contract and they said, here's a couple million bucks, build it for that use the old Zeppelin model. We don't want a lot of innovation. We just want the thing to work. You go do that. And meanwhile, over here, the socialist airship is going to be the visionary, idealistic airship. 
it's going to be it's just going to be filled with all kinds of wild new technologies and uh and this is as as we go along these these sort of two ships um get built and they indeed turn out the way they were they were meant to be um and the capital air the capitalist airship is a better airship but uh and it and it doesn't crash and the government the socialist airship does crash I'm sure someone will pull a metaphor out of that, but we're not going to do that either. Um, <laughs> because it's it's this fascinating sort of competition of almost government excess going on, isn't it? Because on, on, on one side, you've got a very interesting group of designers whose names most people will know, but probably not for airships in, in Barnes-Wallace um, and his calculator, who's Neville Shute, who go go away from making calculations and writing some fabulous fabulous stories it, it's it's weird that a lot of what we have is their you know the, the guys who survive are the guys that tell the story isn't it and and their input from what they were doing and what they perceived was happening down at cardington because they're, they're up in the, the northwest aren't they so they're they're a ways away from what's going on at cardington Right. It's it. What part of the story becomes this competition between the R one hundred and and the R one hundred and one? And it is interesting. They, Thompson should never have done that. He he split. I mean, there were the the, the surviving. Uh, there was a terrible British air crash in nineteen twenty one, where basically most of the airship establishment have gone down with it. So there were very few people. Which should, with have been, with, should have been a clue, really, shouldn't it? Should have been a clue. Yeah. It was <laughs> But so there wasn't there weren't very many British airship designers out there with any experience at all. Uh, and and by splitting all the, the talent, if you will, between the R100 and the R101, uh, you know, they, they in effect, I think, doomed R101. So the, the, the person with by far the most skill and talent and who is, in fact, a legendary um, uh, uh, engineer, a British engineer, Barnes Wallace, ends up with. And his assistant Neville shoot end up on the R100, and they have major grudges against the R100. There's no cooperation at all. Nobody returns phone calls, so to speak. They don't. They're they're. It, it becomes a real, a real problem. And I'd say the first of many many problems that beset uh, this airship as they try to make it. I mean, there were a lot of problems in the building of it uh, and in the trials of it. But it started with. Uh, you know, the, the man who should have been running that project was Barnes Wallace, and there should have only been one airship. I'm sure Barnes and Wallace yes, would and have agreed Neville with Shute, you. And Neville Shute, his assistant, you know, this is, there, there are little, funny little corners of the story, like Martha Vivesco, but Neville Shute, his name was Neville Shute Norway, and he wrote under Neville Shute. I mean, one of the most prominent British writers of the mid-century. I mean, he was so prominent that I, little American guy, in, in eighth grade, I read this book called On the Beach, I don't know who put it in my hands. It changed my life. It was about nuclear war. And there, there's a great scene at the end of the uh, well book, but eventually the movie with Gregory Peck, mm-hmm. where I think the, in my memory now that the, the world has just been bombed. And, and he, he's on the bridge of the boat going out of Sydney Harbor, I think it is, or somewhere. And like, they're the last people on earth. Everybody else is dead or about to die or the radiation has been released. I'm just thinking, wow. Anyway, so this is sort of meaningful to me that he, he was one of the airship designers who, you know, did survive and did comment on, uh, on R101. Let's focus on 101. As much as I'd love to talk about Neville Shooting, yeah, his <laughs> books. My my grandmother foisted his books on me at a young age and loved loved them all. Um, but let's again another rep. this seriously we we could we could digress beautifully. Batman Neville Shoot, we'd be away. R one hundred one in itself becomes very quickly. <sighs> I hate to use the term over-engineered because it crashes so clearly it, it was, but it to make it work, they keep having to try new things, but then also strip stuff out of it to to make it work. Because the calculations to make an airship fly are very, very finite. It's, it's, it's hi- hydrogen plus weight, and then that gives you your altitudes and things. So you, you describe it a lot better than I just did in your book. But to make R101 work, they have to make some remarkable compromise, especially considering what they're making it out of. 
They are. It's a it's a it's a technological moonshot. I mean, fr- from the point of view of 1927, 1928, 1929, 1930. I mean, it was uh, uh, as you were saying, the question of being over engineers. Well, he, he, one of the things they did to over-engineer it, I think, was one of the causes of the crash, which is they they decided they were b- before R101. All the engines that you know, so on a uh, let's take a ship like R101. Okay, it's 777 feet long, larger by volume than the Titanic, the largest thing that has ever flown in history of the world, and it's going up there, and it's got five engines on it, and the and so the the engines normally would be gasoline engines um, of one type or another. Um, but because this ship was flying over the tropics, or you know, the 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 thought was that gas fumes were flammable, and therefore you didn't want something flammable sitting right beneath. I mean, these engines are slung beneath the the envelope of the airship. You didn't want something like that there because you know you've got 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen sitting just above you. In fact, this was a, a false fear. I mean, it was it was an unfounded, not a false fear. It was an unfounded fear. Um, so, but but to address this and to make you know this, there was a Titanic-like attempt to make uh, this airship uh, well the equivalent of unsinkable, um, as Thompson said, as as safe as a house, but for the millionth chance. I mean, something that just couldn't crash. They really thought that they were doing this. And one of the ways they were doing this was they took diesels from locomotives and they put them up into the air, into these engine nacelles that would drive the engines of R101. Now, and the reason was because the the uh, heavy oil or diesel didn't have a, or had a very, I guess we would call a high flash point, right? It, it didn't, mm. it, it, it was very, un, I mean, you couldn't set it on fire. You could put a match to it and it would, and it would, uh, burn so this was the idea the problem was but you take these locomotive diesels these beardmore tornado 650 horsepower diesel and you hoist them up into the air into a lighter than air ship by the way which everything has been stripped out of and it's like double the weight of the gas engine which then creates all of these problems and they were the principal problem when when the when the thing first flew they realized oh my god it's too heavy It, it will never go anywhere mainly because of these engines that they decided they were going to put up there. All sorts of technology went into this and all sorts of engineering. And it was, it was in fact, uh, it was a mistake. It was over-engineered, caused the airship to be too heavy and necessitated all sorts of re-engineering, which then created their own problems. But there were so many engineering problems on this thing. It's so many organizational screw-ups it's hard to know where to start it's page after page of you know as as a business analyst it's like case study after case study of, yes, of how not is. to run a run a project and it's I, I i love your descriptions of how the plush lounges and and uh, rooms on board are essentially veneered balsa wood because they, they can't have <laughs> mahogany and things on it because it's too heavy. They're having to cut right back to the lightest possible woods they can and and then painting them. It's it's just this remarkable stripping back of of things and and to to what would be expected of the people that would be traveling upon it. Yeah, it was. Uh, so they tried. They put everything on the ship. That was the idea. Everything conceivable thing. So somebody at the uh, this wonderful dirigible magazine, you know, put a uh, put together a, a diagram with all the arrows pointing to all the new the wild new technologies that they put in and things that had never been done before. So they had this, you know, elaborate dining hall, you know, that looks is, is meant to look kind of like a Pullman car or like an admiral's quarters in a steamship. In fact, it's all balsa wood and linen. It's it's nothing. I mean, in ultralight aluminum, they have a, a lounge, they have a, a promenade, uh, you know, with a, with a, with a, a big window, a big cell and window that you can, you can look at that. They have a, a smoking lounge in a, in a ship filled with 5.5 million cubic feet of hydrogen gas. Uh, it, it, it it just goes on and on and on. And all this was, you know, uh, engineered. I mean, they, they wanted to make this the most luxurious thing that uh, it, it, that had ever flown, which it clearly was. At that point, nothing was even close to it. Um, it was still not as luxurious as uh, 
as you know, like a, a canard uh, air, uh, ocean liner, mm. because you, you just couldn't, you know, as you say, hoist mahogany up there. But uh, all of these things, all of these technologies were put in. I mean, they, the, the gas bags on this thing were 10 stories high. I mean, imagine a cheese wheel 10 stories high that is made out of cattle intestines that holds 550,000 cubic feet of hydrogen. And these things were held in place inside this 777 foot long airship by these incredibly innovative parachute harnesses that no one had ever done before. Again, engineered to the max. As it turns out, they, they failed to keep the bags from grating against the girders and getting holes in them, lots of thousands of them, which then leaked hydrogen. And anyway, there, were, there was so, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to, I, it seems like I'm singling out Great Britain here for technological flaws. Airships were deeply, deeply flawed things from the very beginning. And hydrogen was just one of them, enormously vulnerable to wind, weather of any kind. They were just, they were a bad idea. And it took 40 years for people to realize they were a bad idea. And, and, and that was that. But the, the you know, the, the Germans were the ones who invented it. And the Americans absolutely got on board. And they all pretty much lost all their airships to crashes. Um, so there was a, uh, the, the Americans were very much in the technological race in the 20s. Um, they were building helium filled airships, which everybody thought, hey, for helium, that what could possibly go wrong, right? Well, look at a terrible record of crashes, three really, well, three really bad ones that were entirely built and engineered by the Americans. So everybody, everybody had, you know, and as far as hydrogen fireballs go, there were 75 of them. I mean, you think of the Hindenburg as well. That's a, well, oh, that's wild. That's crazy. That's incredible. No, it happened all the time. And the only reason you and I don't know about that is because there wasn't that 30 seconds of film that changed the world. Everybody in every movie theater in the world saw the Hindenburg go up in flames in 1937, which, by the way, was seven years after the R101 went up in this in a similar hydrogen fireball. It's. It's wonderful madness. It's, it's a line I use quite a bit when when, when talking about <laughs> mar- marvels of the air that that are strange. You know, it's the the way you capture the sort of almost internal politicking of we need to make all these changes, but we can't tell anyone we're making these changes because we've got to make the trip to, to Karachi. It's it's weird. It's in, the book is fantastic. It's it's imperial politics, yeah, high engineering. And you're just sitting there going, don't stop everybody. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it, it's a book. It's a book. You know, at some point I, this sometimes this happens to me when I'm writing is, you know, I'm, I think I'm writing about something in, in this case, the crash of an airship and, and uh, this man's dream of the Imperial scheme of which it is the poster ship uh, for which it is the poster ship. But I mean, sometimes in the middle of things and it happened here, I realized that what, yes, I'm writing about an airship crash. But what I'm really writing about is human folly, um, and it's it's widely shared. I say it, 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 this was a flawed idea, you know. And if you go back, and it's a wonderful madness. I love the term. It's like you go, if you look in the say the the aughts or the teens or something, you had these early years of both airships and aircraft, and they're crashing all the time. Both of them are, and I think wonder it's like who, I, I mean. I, I'm not getting on that thing. I mean, I my my personal feeling is no. You you go ahead and and fly the experimental prototype biplane, or the Hercules trimotor, to see if it works. Yeah, I, I just I'll, I'll wait here, okay. And the same thing with airships. They were there was a, a there's a time when the only way technology progresses is through madness. Who who's going to get on that thing? Hmm. I mean, R101 is an experimental prototype, and the, you don't. I, you don't put the, the, a, a cabinet secretary and the D- Britain's director of civil avi- a- a- aviation up in an experimental prototype. It's like it's fine if Chuck Yeager flies the X-1 and tries to break the sound barrier. And, and we, he's, it's expected that he may die. And that's the ground rule. Right? But you don't put the secretary of defense up in the rear seat <laughs> when Chuck goes up, which is what they did in R-101. They should not have put those people in. At one point, Thompson Thompson was so confident he wanted to put a, a hundred MPs up at once, a substantial chunk of the people governing Great Britain, into this thing. Anyway, I'm going on. But. 
No, I'm pretty sure there's a hundred MPs we could put on it today, and everyone would be quite happy. <laughs> Actually, it might be a good thing. <laughs> it, it's yeah, it, that period of, of time is just utterly fascinating because you know you've got this sort of explosion of aviation. You've got air races, flying circuses. You've got all these things where it's becoming more normal, and these these grand steps as well, and this. You know, even of its time, it must have it must have felt slightly out of time that there was this grand thing happening, and you know, of course, when it finally comes in, there's it's in the middle of the the post crash times. Oh, it's we're not going to keep we're not going to talk about the crash and things. People, you need to buy the book because it <laughs> Sam's done it. Sam's done a great job. But now that it's been out for a while, I I grabbed my copy in New York in May. So I've, I've, I've read it. This is going to go out for the UK release as well. It's been out for a while. How do you feel about it? I guess. Oh goodness. It's been out for about what? Four or five months now. Since so, May. Since yeah. May, May 2nd was the, yeah. So uh, just shout out to, to one nine two books in, in New York, which is my new favorite bookshop for. Oh, for, cool. For, it was fantastic. Well, it's been, it, it's been selling well and, and, and it's been reviewed very well. And, you know, you, in, 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 uh, you know, over here, you, you get a spectacular New York Times review, which I got. You know, it's that's very good. In the old days, that used to be the only, you know, didn't matter what else you did. You know, and these days you you have to link up with the online world and, and, and the world that isn't just a publicist who's trying to get your story in the Chicago Tribune, which is the old way. It isn't the new way. But I think it's been, you know, I was I don't know. I, I, I My sense is that it's it's it. it People are interested in it, and people are talking about it. So that's good. I beyond that, I I can't control what happens. And you, you end up talking to random random guys on a podcast. That <laughs> yeah, world, that's yeah. right. That's right. People in some foreign country that I don't even know where the foreign country is. Yet. Someone in a foreign country who's actually thinking about your weather sounding quite nice. Because what is it? It's about 120 in Texas at the moment. Or? Yeah. So so to put it in in your terms, today it's hitting 42.2. Ooh. Okay, so and yesterday was forty two point two, and tomorrow will be forty two, and the next day will be forty two, and the next day we am going out as far as we can see. So this is not normal. And uh please, some dreary, wet British weather, please, please send it to Texas. I, I can I can hear listeners because this is gonna be going out in October. There's gonna be some listeners here in the UK just <laughs> shouting at you now. But that that sounds <laughs> tough. <laughs> It's pretty oh. tough. But it's, um, speaking uh, speaking of the UK, I mean, I was, you know, part of the fun of this book was I started it right, right when COVID started. So, it, you know, I, I use libraries, museums and your collections and things like that. And, you know, they're all close to me globally, uh, globally, everything, every single library, museum, whatever. And so I had to do all these workarounds in the British airship community, which is small and intense and wonderful. They helped they helped me out. But I eventually got to uh well I, I stayed in richmond for three weeks and and uh last, we had a couple of years i guess it's last year um had a wonderful time and uh, you know going to the, the united kingdom archives the raf museum brooklyn's the, the private archives here and i just had a great time it was oh and the cardington sheds you know I, I, it was just it was just a great component and i got and i had spectacular spring weather for the whole three weeks I, I think I think you should just come over more if you're going to bring good weather. So <laughs> <laughs> it's it, yeah, can't can't be a British podcast unless there's at least five minutes chatting about weather. I think that's 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 the rule. But Sam, the book is fantastic. Thank you so much for Thank spending you. the last little while chatting about it. And um, as usual, links to getting it are all in the description, and everybody should buy it because it's really good fun. Great, it's been great talking to you, man. I can't thank Sam enough for joining us here on the Damcasters. I love the book. I grabbed my copy back in May at the fabulous 101 Books in New York, read it in a couple of sittings, and I'm delighted to say that it's out now in the UK, so you can grab it at all good and evil bookshops, including, not evil, but supporting the pod bookshop of our very own Damcasters bookshop on bookshop.org. Link is in the description below, 10% goes to support the pod, all that usual stuff. You may have heard my reticence about R101, but I think where we are now with airships and lighter than air vehicles is in an interesting place, especially with Airlander, which hybrid air vehicles are building up at Cardington right now. 
So watch that space on this. As always, thank you for your support of the pod. Tell your friends, pop some stars into the algorithm, like the videos, do all that sort of thing. We're going to have some fun stuff coming up, especially some news about the Pima Air and Space Museum and what's going on there. They've been incredibly generous supporters of the pod, so we're going to see what's going on out there. If you want to become a damn castier, you can join us over on Patreon from just £3 a month. On that, you'll get all of these episodes early, different intros, outros, basically me rambling a little bit more. But there's going to be gift packs. You get a hand-signed card from me, really. If you can decipher it, good on you. But there'll be like bookmarks and stickers and stuff and some other fun things coming along that they're going to hear about first over there. So, like I said, check that out. Link in the description below. Do give Sam a follow. All his socials are in the description as well. And of course, we're now on Blue Sky, which is great because it's like Twitter, but without the chaos. Give it time. We shall see. All the links to our socials are on our link tree. Thank you so much for your support. This has been great fun over the last year we've been doing this now. And I can't thank you enough. I've already said that. So we're going to wrap it up. Until next time, do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone and is a Bony Abroad podcast production. To learn more about our podcast and check out our previous episodes, head to www.thedamcasterspod.com.